not be found on the Pharisee's service. March 28, 2024. We shall begin with the reading of scripture, specifically the Gospel of John, the 13th chapter, the first through the 17th verses. The Gospel of John, the 13th chapter, the first through the 17th verses. And in that passage, we find these words. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then coming to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, Dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He that is washed needeth not saved to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, Ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet, and had taken his garments, and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? He called me Master and Lord. And you say, well, for so I am. If I have been your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Oh, gracious and eternal God, we just thank you. We thank you because here we are. Knowing full well we don't have to be here. Only your grace, only your mercy has kept our golden moments rolling on a little while longer. Many who started out with us are not here anymore. But God, you've kept us. God, you've blessed us. You've never, ever left us. And so, God, we thank you right now. We praise your name right now. And God, we pray that you would bless this hour. Cause us, we pray, to draw nearer to thee by the hearing of your precious word. God, bless us with your word. Bless us to the very depths of our hearts. To the end that we leave this place better than we were when we are. Bless these men of God who will break the bread of life tonight. God, as they open their mouths, speak through them and speak to us. God, just bless us and bless us and bless us. And God, we will be careful to give you the praise, give you the glory, and give you the honor. This we ask in the strong, in the mighty, in the magnificent, the majestic name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
the Reverend Jedediah Jackson with a message on the commemoration of the institution of the Lord's Supper. We ask you to pray with him and pray for him as he brings us a word from the Lord. And then it reads, And the first day of unleavened bread, when 
they killed the Passover. His disciples said unto him, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare that thou mayest eat the Passover? And he sendeth forth two of his disciples and saith unto them, Go ye into the city, and there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wheresoever he shall go in, say ye to the good man of the house, the master saith, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared. There make ready for us. And his disciples went forth and came into the city and found as he had said unto them. And they made ready the Passover. And in the evening he cometh with the twelve. And in the 22nd verse it says, And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed it, and brake it and gave it to them, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine, until that day I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Amen, amen, amen. I want to share with you for the next few moments on the subject, setting the table. Setting the table. Uh, my brothers and sisters, we're here tonight to observe the near apex or culmination of Holy Week, Holy Thursday. Holy Week was a busy and emotionally charged week for our Lord and Savior. From his triumphant entry into Jerusalem on Sunday when the crowds laid palms at his feet and adoration was laid on his name to not a day later, Jesus cursing the fruitless fig tree and clean, cleansing the temple of the money changers on Monday to then responding to questions of his authority and talking to Philip about his coming sacrifice on Tuesday to allowing Judas to meet with the chief priests to come up with the plan for his betrayal on Wednesday. This was a week like none other in recorded history. And now we find ourselves here on Thursday where we see Jesus speaking to two of his disciples and his disciples ask Jesus, Master, where will we eat the Passover? The Passover meal is one of the most sacred traditions in Jewish culture, commemorating how God delivered the Israelites from the bondage of Egypt. And Jesus tells two disciples, as Luke 22 and 8 gives us reference, that Jesus instructed Peter and John to go meet a man carrying a pitcher of water and follow him. And follow him where he goes in. And ask the good man of that house that he goes into, where is the guest chamber where we shall eat? And the good man will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared. And he told Peter and John, there, make ready for us. And Peter and John did just as they were instructed and found themselves at a place historians believe was called the Cynical on Mount Zion, outside of the walls of the old city of Jerusalem. And they gathered to eat there the final time together, where Jesus would break bread and they would drink wine to symbolize the transformed body and blood of Jesus. The focus on the commemoration of the last dinner party of Jesus and his disciples was a symbolic foreshadowing of the impending sacrifice of Jesus and the sin debt that he was about to pay. And why is this ordinance so important to remember as Jesus instructed? An ordinance, by definition, is a prescribed religious rite. While the act of communion doesn't save you, like baptism, it is an ordinance of our faith. And it is an outward display of an inward faith in Jesus. The commemoration of the, Lord's, of the Lord's Supper gave the disciples and gives us a chance to remember the love of Jesus in a way that could be shared to remind the followers of Christ what the Lord had done for them. And tonight I want you to focus on one vitally important aspect of the Lord's Supper shared between Jesus and his disciples. And that aspect is the preparation of their last fellowship together. Preparation was the theme of the evening in which Jesus gave a multitude of instructions and lessons in the upper room where they gathered for the Passover. And as a part of preparation, any time you eat, and as the disciples prepared to eat with their master, their friend, for the final time, the table had to be set. When one looks to the definition of setting the table, the Cambridge Dictionary says the phrase means to put a cloth, a knife, fork, etc. on the table in preparation for a meal. And if we're looking at a figurative definition, setting the table means to prepare for what's about to happen or to make a way for a future outcome. Everyone in our scripture tonight, Jesus, his disciples, all had to prepare for what was about to happen, knowing the future outcome. The future outcome would unfold later that night and what was on the horizon of the next day. And I argue tonight that in the life of a Christian, much as on the night of the Lord's final Passover supper, preparation is a substantial element of the faith in the life of a believer. A Christian must be and must remember to be prepared. And 
your preparation or lack thereof can create very different outcomes in your walk on this earth. And there are a couple of very critical elements that I want to share with you tonight as it relates to setting the table. First, when setting the table, you must follow God's instructions. Jesus, in tonight's scripture, gave very clear instructions to Peter and John. They followed them to the word, and they accomplished the task that their master had given them. They asked the Lord. Jesus said, do exactly this, and they were set up for success. We ought to know as believers, our instruction book, our Bible, is very specific and calls for those that know Jesus to follow the word of God. God gives us tasks every day of our lives. Those tasks are always going to line up to his will and his word. And it is incumbent upon us, the children of God, to follow those tasks. And our faith dictates that we must. When we are given instructions, we must first turn our ears to his word. His word is our scripture. All scripture is breathed out by God. And 2 Timothy reminds us that his word is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. See, we have a cheat sheet for this life in the Bible. And we can compare all thoughts against the scriptures to ensure that we are really hearing from God. If what we heard doesn't give life and health or train in righteousness, then we can rest assured that it was not of God. If what you heard aligns with the scripture, then trust me, you are hearing from the Lord. And this begs the question, who and what are we listening to? How are we studying and what is in our hearts? And when we listen to his words, we can then keep them within our heart. That there's a promise here. Keeping God's word within our heart is life to our whole body. In Matthew, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's why it's important to guard our hearts. It's the key to life. Everything we do flows from it. A, a tree is determined by its fruit. So you got to ask yourself, what is the overflow of your heart saying? What, what fruit is coming out of your mouth? And when the heart is full with what God says, then our flow, our walk in this life will be righteous, good, and full of hope. It will be free from perversity and corrupt talk. Then you'll see clearly the straight path. What you say affects what you see. If you speak things of God, you will see it clearly follow things of God. There's a power of life and death in the tongue. Those who love it, use it, and will eat of its fruit. And, and just ask yourself every day, can you see life in everything that you do? What are the people around you saying? Are they speaking the truth? For, for instance, have you ever turned down the radio so you can see clearly where to go? Or, or stop talking in order to concentrate better? See, our mouths and what we listen to can distract us from what we need to see. How do we view ourselves and how do we view others? What have our mouths said that will make us view things differently than they are? When we see clearly and we walk in faith, we can then place our feet firmly on the path that God has for us. We will be sure of the way to go and we won't have a need to turn in any direction except toward God. We will be sure of our instructions and it all starts with hearing from God. Our hearing impacts the entire body. If we don't hear correctly, then it's a slippery slope to not being on the path that God laid out for us. So let's take out time and ensure we are hearing from God by studying the scriptures and setting the table that God has for us as he prepares the many blessings that come from following his will and his way. And second, not only must you follow the instruction God gives you, but you must remember the instructions you are given. You must remember the instructions you are given. Just doing something for the Lord once does not mean that you don't have to do it again. Uh, we are not of a checking the box faith. This is a marathon. This is not a sprint. The, the ordinance that we observe tonight of the Lord's Supper requires our remembrance and our repetition. And generally, we ought to remember how God wants us to live in this life and where he brought us from. In reality, we may all tend to forget sometimes what God has done for us. Sometimes we look at where someone else's life is and can't understand why we are where they are. But if we stop and look back at where we once were, where we came from, uh, or the pit that Jesus pulled us out of, maybe we can have a bit more empathy and understanding for others. Uh, sometimes I think our tendency to forget the, the valuable life lessons and, and we, uh, we learn throughout our journey happens simply because life takes over. Uh, when we get busy and forget to return to thank Jesus for past healings from sickness, how, how he made a way, how he provided for us when we were lacking. Uh, for a while, maybe we can continue in this forgetfulness, but trust me, sooner or later, there will be a time when our ability to remember God and his work in our lives will mean everything to us. When will that time be? Usually, it's when we need him to work in our impossible situations in our lives. How, however, we must be intentional on how we remember what God has done for us 
and give him the glory because he deserves it. Every day we walk this earthly journey through remembering God's greatness. We are setting the table that God has for us in preparation for what he will do in our lives. And it is a constant, ever active work to prepare oneself for God's blessings. A check on the record reveals that the 31st Psalm, verse 19 says, and the writer is talking about God, it says, How abundant are the good things that you have stored up for those who fear you, that you bestow in the sight of all on those who take refuge in you. God will bless you abundantly when you prepare. Remember, fear, revere, and follow him. He will make a way. That's those 10,000 blessings that pastor talks about often. And he will do it in front of others, believers and non-believers. And at the core of that preparation is your remembrance of the goodness of God. So what does it mean to remember? Does it simply suggest we shouldn't let thoughts slip out of our mind? Does it mean we reminisce on the sufferings of Jesus so I really feel thankful or could really feel awful and have that Christian guilt sometimes we exhibit? Uh, for many Christians to remember is an ambiguous mental activity, but in the Bible, a call to remember, especially when tied to a covenant sign or ceremony, is a vibrant, powerful, and participatory concept where we recalibrate our lives according to what's being remembered. Remembering our instructions is not merely a subjective recall to mind, but especially when considering the Lord's Supper, it is an active manifestation of the continuing and active and actual significance of the death of Christ. There are two types of remembering. The first is speculative and transient, and the second is affectionate and permanent. See, a speculative remembrance is only to call to mind the history of a, such a person and the sufferings that Christ was once put to death in the flesh. But an affectionate remembrance is when we recall Christ and his death to our minds is to feel the powerful impressions that that sacrifice left on our hearts. When the Lord's Supper is served, believers experience an affectionate remembrance. Because the gospel is being recalled and reapplied. We remember the grace purchased at Christ's death is the same grace we need when we come to the table, his table, and how that table needs to be set. Christians today regularly hear that the gospel is believed once for salvation, uh, but is reapplied daily. But the gospel isn't one and done. It, it's rinse and repeat, like I said earlier. Salvation is a progressive work. This Growing awareness of what it means to remind ourselves what the gospel means to us daily or to apply the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to our lives might give us some insight as to how we look to Christ and again receive his grace as we eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord's Supper. Every time we take communion, the gospel is proclaimed and we believe and embrace it again. In other words, we remember. My hope is that tonight we when we come to the Lord's table, we come with eagerness and expectancy, believing that this is not a dull religious ceremony, this is not rote, but a spiritual gospel experience. That Jesus is right there talking to us at the prepared table. That we transport ourselves there to see our Lord at a table that is set for all that wish to be there. So tonight, as I leave you, remember God's instructions by remembering who you trust. Remember his strength and how he is someone that you can depend on to be there when you need a friend. Remember what he does with his strength and how he protects you from and pulls you out of less than ideal situations. Remember God's grace and mercy and how he makes a way out of no way and allows your moments to roll on just a little while longer. Remember how he sacrificed for you to have eternal life that by consuming his body and his blood, we can be there around that table with him and the disciples. And remember God's instructions by what he has already done for you in your life. Yeah. Tonight we are here with a table set before us. A, a table with plates, bread and grape juice laying on a white cloth. On a table covered with a white cloth. The table etched with the scripture, do this in remembrance of me. Yeah. And it is important not only to follow instructions and remember those instructions, but to make sure you show others how to remember. Yeah. When you talk about the goodness of God, it helps us yeah. to remember. When we hear about the body, how it was broken for us, it helps us to remember. When we hear about the blood, his precious blood shed for you and for me, it helps us to remember. It helps us to remember how to prepare your mind, your heart, and your mouth to tell somebody about the goodness of God and how he cared enough for us to send his only son to die for our sins. When you remember all of that, it is a testimony to the goodness of God. Thank you, Lord, this evening. As I close, this scripture and this subject reminded me what it was like when you sat down to dinner. Uh, maybe not what we do nowadays with the TV trays and the plastic utensils, but before we would sit down as a family for dinner. 
especially if company came over. I would hear Sister Jackson with a very loud, Jed, from the back of the house. I would stop what I was doing because I knew company was coming. I knew the table had to be set. I would get on my red trike. That was my in-house motorcycle. And I would speed down the hallway of my shotgun style house. I would went past my parents' room, my dad's study, the computer hutch, and I would end up in the kitchen with the smell of roast, dirty rice, veggies, all the smells. One would want to get when dinner was about to be ready. Now, because I was old and I, I had a lot of the responsibility of getting the table ready. So mom would give me the placemats, the fine white china plates with the blue printed rim design, the, the silver fork, spoon, and knife. I had to get the ice for the glasses out of the ice tray that I had set a few hours before because I had to prepare. And I had to follow my mother's exact instructions to make sure that the table was presentable for company so that the meal would be a success. And when the guests came because the table was set, they knew that their host cared for them. What God is asking you to do is remember to do as he wants you to do. Remember the sacrifice. And what we see in the scripture, the room will be prepared and your walk on this earthly journey will be a success. But you must be ready. Make your mind ready. Make your heart ready. Because at the end of our earthly journeys, when we all get to the great upper room, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we will say and shout the victory. Prepare to set the table in your life so one day you can sup with your Savior. And remember on that night in Jerusalem, the table was set for the Son of Man to sacrifice his life for us. Jesus said in his Father's house are many mansions. And on our mansion over there, I know there is a table prepared for you and for me and those that believe in the Lord. So remember his love, remember his passion, his goodness, his grace, and his mercy. And set your table. God bless you.
As these last events unfold in the life of the Lord, we are allowed to witness some of the most heinous and most holy events ever being played outside the outside. And this passion before us is one of the most holy. As we join Jesus and his men again, they are doing an eventful night. They have just finished the Passover. They left the room where they celebrated the Passover and made their way to the room and down from the down to Kennedy Valley. Lord have mercy tonight. To the place called Gethsemane. And on the way to Gethsemane, Jesus discussed them and talked with them about heaven, about the peace of God, about how to surrender to the Lord, the coming of the Holy Spirit. And he prayed a wonderful, powerful prayer. And there you find it in John chapter 17. All this occurred as they made their way to the garden of Gethsemane. In our text today, we focus on what happened when they arrived at the place called Gethsemane. But just for a little while, we'll come together and consider what took place that night. On that night, Gethsemane, became the more than a garden where Jesus and his men spent the time. Yeah. On that night, the Gethsemane became a place where the internal business and transactions of the glory of God took place. But I want to turn, I want to point out some facts tonight about Gethsemane. I want you to see that it was a place of pressure. Pressure. Place of prayer and a place of priority. Let us consider some facts together as we move forward tonight. When we talk about it being a place of pressure, the name of the God was Gethsemane. It is probably one of one of his friends, the friends of the Lord. While in the famous nowadays, now while famous in nowadays. It still exists just outside the city of Jerusalem. In the Lord's day, it was probably a small garden enclosed by a wall and guarded by a gated fence. Sound like a gated fence. We getting that depressed. Depressed. He said it was a place that Jesus often visited with his men. Gethsemane seems to have been a refuge for the Lord. It was a place where he could find solitude from the crowds of the ministry that occupied his life. It was a place where he could go and find private moments to commune with his father. It was a sanctuary from the attacks of his enemies. It was a place of refreshment from the long days of ministry. It was a special place for the Lord and his men. The name Gethsemane is in Arabic in origin. The word means out of press. Gethsemane was and is a place where the olive trees grew and produced their fruit. The olives were collected, placed in a press, and with the precious oil, olive oil, was abstracted from the olive under intense pressure. When Jesus and his men arrived at Gethsemane, he, he leaves the eight disciples and at the gate to the garden. And he takes Peter, James, and John with him. And they go deeper into the God. And the question is, why did he single out these men? Yeah, yeah. Well, it seemed that they were leaders amongst the group. All right. They would see and hear things that, that would serve as a, a teaching moment that they might be able to lead other disciples in the future. Right. But Jesus gave these three time of a special ministry so they could be used to help others grow. The Lord is still doing the same thing today. But he will put some of his people in a situation where they can see, where they can hear, and experience other things they can't imagine. He does it so that he might, he might use them to teach others about the power of his grace and sufficiency. But on this night, our Lord will enter into the out of trust. And the sweet all of grace and submission of the Father would be 
extracted from the Lord's life. Let sweet smell and say it. He said, For Jesus, the Garden of Gethsemane would be a place of intense pressure. Our text tells us about some of the pressures he faced that night. Yeah. There were internal pressures. The very language of these verses reveals that the truth that Jesus Christ, in the same time of intense, he was dealing with, at the same time, intense and emotional and spiritual trials. Yeah. For it was, the scripture says, he was so amazed. This phrase simply means to be stuck with terror. The word was an idea of terrified surprise. But Jesus knew what was coming. But as he looked into the cup, he was about to drink. He was astonished. And he was overcome by awe. No other human had ever experienced such an anguish of the soul, such as this was was coming up for us. He was very heavy. This speaks of the condition of great stress and anguish. For it was that he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrow. This phrase literally means to be overwhelmed with sorrow. We get the word priority from this word. It, it means to be surrounded. But Jesus was surrounded and overwhelmed with sorrow. But can't you hear him say that in Isaiah chapter 53? That he was a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. But yet he said, even unto death. This phrase meaning that Jesus was at the front of death. But as he prayed in Gethsemane, it was possible for the person to die of anguish alone. The Word of God te is telling us that Jesus was overwhelmed emotionally as well as spiritually. Yeah. Spiritually, by the way he experienced as he entered into the garden of the city that night. Think about the pressure the Lord was under. Lord have mercy. He knows about the how. He knows he is about to suffer intense and physical pain. He knows he is about to become sin on the cross. He knows that he is about to be judged by the Father. He knows. For the first time in eternity, there will be a breach in the broken fellowship he has enjoyed with his Father. He knows. He knows that he will be abandoned by his nature. His followers and his followers. He knows. He knows that he's about to be tried, rejected, condemned to death by the people he came to save. He knows the most powerful human government on the earth is about to turn up his fiery, his fiery fire upon him. The thoughts of what he is about to endure literally overwhelmed his mind and his heart. It was a time of extreme internal pressure. <laughs> Thank God that he endured the spiritual and emotional trials and, and made his way to Calvary yeah, yeah. so that he might be saved. Yeah. Not only was it a place of pressure, but it's a place of prayer. Yeah. Prayer is relationship. Yeah. Oswald Chamber says prayer is the bread of work. Yeah. But Jesus leaves these eight men again at the gate of the garden. He takes three deeper in the garden with him. Yeah. He tells these three Peter, James, and John to wait with him. Yeah. To wait for him. To watch while he's going to pray. Lord help the word means to give strict attention to something or detail. Yeah. These men were to keep their eyes open and trust yeah. And they were to pray with him. Yeah. And probably pray for him. Yeah. 
Jesus went deep into Gethsemane to pray. But I want to look at how he prayed just for a few moments. Now I'm coming to pray. Jesus prostrated himself on yeah. the ground yeah. and began to call on the phone. He addressed himself first. He said, Ah. This is an Arabic term that is equivalent to the word dad. Yeah. It is the word of intense intimacy. It is the word used by the Jewish household of that day. But it was a word that, the, that no Jew would ever use when he was speaking to God. But Jesus enjoyed such an intimacy with the Father that he felt most comfortable with calling him dad. In him, we have the same privilege. Peter said in Romans chapter 8, verse 15, he says, For we have not been given the spirit of violence again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So Jesus, we have the same privileges that Jesus enjoyed. We are, we brought
But he was obedient. The obedience of his prayer. Jesus concluded his prayer. He expressed absolute obedience to the Father. He did not want to be separated from the Father. He did not desire to experience the Father's wrath. He did not want to become sin. But he was willing to do it because it was the Father's plan for his life. For he says these words, I will, and I will. Let us know that this was a true time of testing for the Savior. While Jesus was sinning and unable to sin, he faced a time of severe test, severe temptation. Just as he had in the mount or in the wilderness three times. And a year and a half later, he would, he would gain the victory, remain submissive to the Father's will. He's willing. He did it willing. He did it so that he might have a way to be saved. He did it so that when the lost cried out, God the Father, in the name of Jesus our Savior, would give them and bring unto them salvation made of it. He did it because he loved us. He believed that Jesus was saved by, by grace. His death became our death. His blood washed away our sin. Do you know our Savior? Or you can? If you come to him, he will save you. Yeah. If you come to him, he changes life yeah. and eternity. Yeah. Come to Jesus and receive yeah. it to your heart. Yeah. That the the place of problems. Jesus prayed in the garden that night. Two sets of problems are given, played out. These priorities reveal the contrast between sin and Savior and a sinful man. The priority of the master. Jesus had an over, overriding, overarching priority in his life. He lived to follow the will of the Father. He was, he was 12 years old. And when he said, Wouldst thou know that I must be about? My father's business. Lady said, Mommy, is to do the will of him that sent me yeah. and to finish it. Yeah. He said, I came down from here yeah. not to do my own will, yeah. but the will of him that sent yeah. The priorities of men. He said, While Jesus was praying and wrestling with the greatest load. Any man that ever kept yes, his disciples yes. fell asleep. Yes. Jesus commanded them to watch. Mm -hmm. And they tired. <coughs> they were tired. Yes. And they all fell asleep. Yes. These same three men who, who experienced the glory of God on the mount <coughs> of Christ's Now they are asleep yes. through the greatest spiritual struggle the world ever witnessed. These men had been privileged to watch the greatest high priest of heaven as he approached the fathers in the holy of his holy. They had a privilege that no other man ever had, that they never enjoyed. And they slept. They slept all the way through. Three times the Lord went to them. And he all he came back every time. And he said, Could not tell why but one hour. Jesus returned to find him sleep again. And then he called his son. And this was the same Peter, old man. It means to hearken and not to listen. Hmm. Peter had listened to the Lord. And he wasn't acting like he knew Peter. He was acting like the old Peter, the old son. He was acting like the rock. But Peter had just, just burst and, and he was willing to die with Jesus. Yeah. 
You know, he said, Lord, wherever you go, I'll go with you. Yeah. He said, now he came even to the state that he awakened while they were praying and wondering. They are indifferent to all the evil that's around. They lack true and moral, spiritual virtue. The God. The beautiful God. I come to the God of love. And the do is still on Filthy cup. Let it pass. 
hands from me. Nevertheless, nevertheless, aren't you glad about nevertheless? I'm glad, I'm glad about nevertheless. Because nevertheless included me. Nevertheless included you. And it nevertheless allows us to call out to God and say, God, have mercy in he hears our cry and pities our every. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be. Oh God. Oh God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. 
many times as you do this. Do this in remembrance.
It's Holy Thursday. It's a marvelous good time. Let us praise Him. Let us worship Him. Let us adore Him for all that He's done. And now may the Lord watch between thee and me. While we're absent one from another, may the Lord cause His face to shine upon us all and afford us each and every one that peace that passeth all understanding. Let us all respond by saying,